I've never written a single line of assembly before, but I am about to implement Conway's Game of Life from scratch using the lowest level programming language there is. And I'm going to show you the difference between this and using C to create a terminal text editor, using C++ to make a file manager, and using Java to make a web server, starting with one of the highest level programming languages there is. Python. This is a language that needs no introduction. It's the fourth most popular programming language after what the f second most popular programming language after JavaScript. It's got a garbage collector, a virtual environment, and dynamic typing. What actually happens on the hardware when you write a line of Python? Nobody knows. This is the language that was famous for having slow for loops, but it is the people's champion for a reason. Sometimes, if I think about writing a Python script a little too hard, it's already done. I asked ChatGPT to suggest a UI library for Conway's Game of Life, and it wrote a complete working implementation instead, in like 50 lines of code. The Game of Life is a zero-player game. It has a grid of alive and dead cells and four rules. Any live cell with fewer than two live neighbors is lonely and dies. Any live cell with two or three live neighbors lives. Any live cell with more than three live neighbors gets suffocated and dies. Any dead cell with exactly three living neighbors becomes alive. You can set the initial state to be whatever you like and just see how it plays out. Some situations die out while some can go on forever. You can make some pretty cool patterns. A common pattern to start with is this one, since it makes an infinite glider that will fly across the map. I'm eventually going to make a little glider like this in assembly. Python has many tools to make this program easy to write. I can import libraries that help me draw to the screen and manipulate arrays. I can use if statements, loops, and functions to control the flow of a program and repeat mundane tasks. I don't have to think about memory or registers or whether my variables are stored on the stack or the heap. I don't even have to think about types at all. I can store whatever I want, whenever I want, without a care in the world. The garbage collector takes care of cleaning up any unused memory and the virtual environment abstracts away the host machine. So I don't even know what my program is running on. Java is a little more grounded than Python. It has static types, so it's bound to be a little more memory efficient. It's also compiled ahead of time, which helps with speed, but it's still garbage collected and still uses a virtual environment to run your code. I can use the standard library to create a HTTP server on port 8080 and set the root endpoint to be handled by my custom handler. This handler ensures that the request method is get, loads a file, and then writes the file data to the output stream. I don't know if you can tell, but classes are everywhere. The server is a class, the request handler is a class, the file is a class, the path is also a class, my program is a class. The only problem is that classes aren't real. They are a lie forced onto us by big OO. The CPU doesn't know what a class is. It just knows about binary numbers. The argument for object orientation is that classes make it easier to organize your program at a high level. But to me, it just looks like meaningless boilerplate. Next, I'm going to make a file explorer in C++, a language that is much lower level than Java. You have no garbage collector, so you have to allocate and deallocate memory yourself. You also have pointers, which means you can actually know whether a function is passed by reference or passed by value for a specific type, instead of pretending to remember and causing a bug. I start by adding some C code that absorbs all the keyboard events instead of printing them to the console. Then I use the file system API to grab the current directory and initialize a new directory class. I have three classes, a directory, which has a name and a list of children, a file, which has a name and a size, and an item, which can either be a file or a directory. The list of children in the directory is just a list of items. So this is kind of a linked list with extra steps. The directory has a couple extra functions to delete and rename specific items and to print all the children to the screen. I just load the current directory on startup, refreshing every time the new directory is selected. I have a lot of pointers and I never really free anything. So I'm pretty sure I'm causing multiple memory leaks here. Welcome to low level programming. To be honest, I have no idea what the hell is going on pretty much all the time with C++. There are so many words and ways to do things. It does have some nice abstractions on types though, like strings, which also aren't real. C++ teaches me that the memory abstraction level of a language is not always correlated with its complexity. C++ is a complicated low level language. 
while Java is a complicated high-level language. Python is a simple high-level language and C is a simple low-level language. I think I just really hate object orientation. I'm going to use C to create my own terminal text editor. You may have heard of Vim or VI Improved. Well, this project is going to be a little bit like that, except worse in every single way. It's going to be called Vin or VI Inferior because it will be just like Vi, but bad. I start by opening a file. I get to use my first malloc of this experiment. I really hope I remember to free it. I also use a couple functions to let me clear the screen and print all lines to the console. I'm storing the cursor as two variables, one for the column and one for the row, and storing an integer to keep track of the current mode. I want to be able to switch between command, insert, and normal mode. I start off very simple by capturing keyboard inputs and moving the cursor's position on every change. I quickly realized I made a mistake though. Storing a row and column for the value of the cursor makes it easier to go up and down rows, but it kind of makes everything else a pain. So I removed the column and added some additional logic when pressing J and K to find the previous or next line and jump to the correct position. Normal mode is working well, but this application is still kind of useless unless I can at least edit and save my file. When I'm in insert mode, I check the character input by the user. If it is the delete key, then I remove the letter currently underneath the cursor. Otherwise, I move all the letters to the right of the cursor up one position and insert the new character. Since memory is manually managed in C, arrays have to be fixed length. I address this by setting a maximum size for my files, but a real programmer would probably need to come up with a proper solution here. The final mode I actually need for my MVP is command mode. I just store all the input characters into a fixed length buffer. The only commands I really need are save and quit. So I wait for the enter key and loop through the buffer executing any command associated with the characters in the list. C is great because it has very little abstraction. There is no object orientation or garbage collector. It doesn't even have strings, but we still need to go deeper. Everything is still a lie. I know nothing is real. Variables, if statements, for loops, none of these things are real. I want to know what the CPU is actually doing. So the only logical next step is assembly. I'm going to be using ARM assembly. I don't want to use a VM or anything like that. I want to communicate with my CPU with as little abstraction as possible. I want to feel at one with my computer. I always advocate for reading source code or documentation directly instead of wasting time with books and tutorials. Why read someone else's interpretation of the truth when you can come to your own conclusions? The only problem is that this is documentation for ARM assembly. So I guess I'll just bang my head against the wall and see what happens. I did use this fantastic cheat sheet a lot though. Most of what you need to know is on this one page. I hope you're ready to look at some assembly code and bad ASCII art, because it's all I've seen for days. Assembly has no loops, no variables, no if statements, and no types. So how do you write a program? You use binary and syscall. Syscall is like a big red button that lets the CPU know you want to do something. You only have one button, but you can perform different actions by setting up the registers in specific ways before pressing it. For example, when I want to write hello world in assembly, I initialize the string as a constant and load the memory address of the value into register one. Then I load the length of the value into register two and the number four into register 16. Then when I activate syscall, the operating system will read the values in those registers and print to the console. To read user input, I can load the address of an empty buffer into register one and load the value three instead of four into register 16. A first logical step for the game of life would be to print the board. So I need a nested for loop. There is no for keyword in assembly. Instead, you can change the control flow by jumping to a specific labeled block. A single loop is pretty simple to create using this feature. I just define a counter by storing zero in register 18 and then store my target in register 19, in this case nine. Then I create a section that compares register 18 and 19. If they are equal, it will branch to the next part of the program. If they are not, then I perform whatever operation I want and increment register 18 before calling the same section again, resulting in a loop. To create a nested loop, I need two counters. The outer loop just compares the first counter and calls the inner loop. The inner loop works just as before, 
but when it's finished, it calls a new section, which increases the outer loop counter and then calls the outer loop section again. It's a little finicky when compared to normal for loops, but it's quite intuitive once you get the hang of it. Now that I can render the grid, I want to try and animate something, even if it's not the game of life just yet. I want to make an enabled block move across the grid for each row. To do this, I need to be able to clear the grid. I did this by printing the delete key a bunch of times. And I also need to figure out a way to add a slight delay so that I don't fry my CPU. I can do this by creating two for loops that continuously call each other. The first one is the nested for loop we had before. But when it finishes, it branches to the wait for next frame then clear section. This section will loop through all the cells and delete them, and then branch to the wait for next frame then draw section. With these two loops infinitely calling each other, the board should toggle between being on and off. Okay, so I wasn't waiting nearly long enough between frames. I can use this thing to create a massive number and wait long enough to make it actually work. I also renamed a couple of the sections and cleaned it up, so everything works correctly now. Debugging is really hard without, well, a debugger. And printing things to the screen is half the problem, so I've created little playgrounds to validate my assumptions in code. I want to store the rows of my grid as 64-bit binary numbers. Since each register can hold 64 bits, I can use each bit to store whether a cell is enabled or disabled. Then I can store those 64 rows on the stack and pull them out as necessary, resulting in a 64 by 64 grid. For this to work, I need to be able to read the nth bit in a binary number. For example, if I have the number 01010101, I want to know whether the fourth bit from the right is a one or a zero, so that I can identify the neighbors of the current cell. I can use the logical shift right operation to move the column I want all the way to the right and then check if that number is equal to one or zero to read its value. Now I can store each row as a value on the stack and this is where the lies begin. You don't really push or pop onto the stack. You have a stack pointer that is manually manipulated and you can read the stack in any order you like. If I reset the stack pointer before reading, then the stack behaves like a queue. If I never move the stack pointer after writing, I will keep overriding the same variable. I have to move the stack pointer in increments of 16, since my values are 64 bits long. This means that the stack is just a stack of memory, not necessarily a stack of plates. But it works well for me, since I can store each row as a value in the stack, and read whichever row I need right now. I can create my animation by reading each row one at a time, and updating the position of the enabled bit for that row, one to the left. There was a few bugs to be fixed, but now that I know I can animate something, I can implement the game of life rules. We just need an initial state, since an empty grid wouldn't be very interesting. I set the initial state to be a glider by manually setting three rows in the stack to be the values I want. By default, the rest of the bytes are filled with zeros on the right, so my glider is all the way to the left. Here's where I encountered the biggest bug of this journey. For some reason, I could not get the cells to update properly. You only ever need to look at three rows at a time when calculating the game of life rules. The current row, the previous row, and the next one. In order to make stack manipulation easier, I wanted to start by loading three rows into three separate registers. I also need a copy of the current row since the updated row shouldn't be used for the calculation of subsequent rows. For example, I can load the current row into register 28 and then load a copy of it into register 29. The previous row is loaded into register 30 and the next row is loaded into register 31. Then whenever I want to process a row, I can look at the data in registers 30, 28 and 31 to find the neighbors and save the updated row in register 29. When I'm ready to read the next row, I can move register 28 to register 30 and move register 31 to register 28. Register 29 is saved to the stack where the original row was. That way I can keep the original row in register 30 and I only have to read the next row from the stack. I was sure that this logic was sound and I even wrote it all out on paper to double check, but no matter what I did, it would not work. I eventually tried this in the playground, where I found that this never works with registers 28, 29, 30, and 31, but it works completely fine with registers 4, 5, 6, and 7. Since I can't read the documentation, I have no idea why this is the case. And with that, I finally have some form of cellular automaton. 
My glider isn't exactly performing as it should though, but at least it's updating something. The final issue here is an issue in the neighbor's calculation. I also figured this one out using the playground. As I explained before, I first do a logical shift right and check the number on the end to see the value of a particular column. When calculating neighbors, I do a logical shift right at each of the neighboring positions and add that value to a common counter. The problem was that I forgot to remove all the numbers on the left as well. So if there was any other cells in the row I was checking, the number added to the neighbor counter would be huge. All I need to do is a binary AND operation with the logical shifter number AND1 to only get the first column. And with that, my glider now flies across the screen as expected. This was really challenging in an engaging and fun way. I'm really glad I took the leap into assembly. I want to do more low level programming. There's a serene simplicity when the only tools you have at your disposal are so basic. It's absolutely not cleaned up, so please don't break your computer, but I've linked all the source code for this video right below the subscribe button. Thank you for watching.